Welcome back to room 136 at Brass Community School. Today we'll be asking uh, Mrs. Eigenberger a few questions related to our chapter. Specifically, I wanted to ask her about differentiated instruction. Now, in our textbook, it talks about uh, all of these different methodologies, such as um, flexible grouping and uh, uh, ability grouping and things like that. When I was looking at that, I thought, well, what is this except uh, another name or a fancy name, another fancy name for uh, what teachers, good teachers do just sort of naturally and as a matter of common sense. Is that, is that the way it seemed to you? Yeah, I think good teachers do differentiate naturally. Um, it's what we would call best practice in teaching. Um, there are some different ways to do it. Um, for example, in a reading group is where you might see some of that flexible grouping. Um, you know, the kids are maybe a little bit closer to being at the same level, but they're they're needing work on different skills, so you're splitting them up in maybe three smaller groups. But, you know, generally working on the same ability level, but maybe with different strengths. And then for in my room, it's more a true ability grouping where... Um, you know, I might have a couple kids working on second grade math and a couple kids working in fourth grade math, and it doesn't have to do with their chronological, chronological age or grade level in school, but it has to do with um, where they are academically for one reason or another. Right, so in a room like this, um, it's almost a de facto sort of differentiated instruction. No matter what you'd call it, that's what you'd be doing, and it would be because you have to differentiate between these different and various levels and uh, kids come in with different uh, disabilities as well that you have to accommodate. Right. So what's the difference between uh, that and just regular accommodation? That's a great question, Dr. Eigenberger. <laughs> um, well, there's there's a lot of difference, I guess, because it I think part of it is dependent on sorting out why students are at the levels they're at. I mean, some students um, cognitively are at a certain level, and they have worked as hard as they could all through the grades, but still maybe are at a first grade level when they're in fourth grade. However, I also see a lot of students, maybe um, like my assistant and I were just talking when you when we get students out of Milwaukee, um, you know, sometimes we get them in third or fourth grade and they haven't, they don't know their alphabet. But after working with them for several months, they're starting to read, they're starting to do basic math. So does that have to do with cognitive level or is it because they haven't been taught? Well, it that's a really different, how you differentiate for a student who's cognitively low and for a student who just hasn't been taught anything academically is really different. Mm -hmm. Now your students are at all of these different levels and uh, they have different requirements. Uh, so as you don't have a general teaching methodology. No. And the general consensus seems to be, at least from the textbook author's point of view, that seat work is overused. Mm -hmm. But I see, I see a lot of your kids doing seat work in here. For example, they were working on the spelling Mm -hmm. And I think seat work in this classroom looks a lot different than seat work in maybe other, certainly than, than regular classrooms, but even other than, you know, different than other um, self-contained EBD rooms. Um, you know, seat work is a little bit harder for kids who obviously have attention issues or behavior issues. So what you will notice in this classroom is even during seat work, there's a lot of movement. That's why my classroom is set up the way it is. So... Um, you know, obviously there's instruction before the seat work, but I think seat work is really done in a non-traditional way in this room, and there's probably a lot more built-in breaks um, for the kids than there would be in regular ed rooms. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of regular ed rooms, um, how much of the things you do for your special ed students as a special ed teacher are viable, valid, uh, methods that could be easily translated into a regular ed classroom. They all are if you're not lazy. Oh, that's, that's an interesting comment. <laughs> so, 
And, and I mean, it takes work. I mean, it does take work to differentiate. It does take more work to plan out four different math lessons and get out math manip manipulatives for four different lessons than it does than if I just said, all right, you're all in fourth, fourth and fifth grade. I think I'll teach fourth grade math and we're all going to do this lesson. Um, I mean, of course that takes more work. Um, and is it a little bit more feasible in a room where there's seven or eight kids as opposed to 25? Sure. But what I find is that if we did that differentiation on the front end and we did the work on the front end for our special needs kids who are still in regular ed, I would see fewer of them in here. Because part of the reason I get some of the kids that I get is because they're so frustrated and so full of anxiety because of of work and, and because it's hard for them to focus that then you see the behaviors because as we know, um, my students would rather be in trouble than look foolish in front of their friends. So if they're feeling like they're not, if they didn't catch all the directions because they have a hard time with auditory learning and then they don't know how to start a worksheet but all their friends around them are starting a worksheet, they feel more comfortable getting in trouble and being the class clown than they do looking stupid and having to ask again for repeated directions. Whereas if we just automatically do some of those things and we write them in IEPs and we write them in behavior plans, that's something a teacher could sweep by and repeat quietly the directions and not single that student out and meet that need without anybody ever knowing it, and then we wouldn't see the behavior. Right. So what would you recommend for beginning teachers, beginning uh, in a school term, what should they do in their, in their classroom to make things easier for them and for the students that are in there? What uh, little steps could they take in terms of, uh, I don't know, assessment, uh, early assessment, and how to respond to, to these different students? Well, I mean, students with significant needs in regular ed should at least have IEPs, and it's fairly easy to align teaching to IEP goals. Um, if a student is labeled special ed, they will always have at least a cross-categorical special ed teacher attached to them. So really, I think as a regular teacher, the most beneficial thing you can do is really um, kind of make yourself open to that special ed teacher's suggestions mm -hmm. and how to modify and how to make those accommodations. Um, because again, you know, sometimes we hear regular ed teachers saying, I don't have enough time in the day and um, it's not fair to my other students and those sorts of things. But what I find is when people really commit and do that work on the front end, it makes the room a lot smoother for that special needs student and then they're going to have a lot fewer problems throughout the year. Right. Now most of these students in, in my course are headed for elementary assignments. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them uh, will be obviously in the, in the early childhood years. Mm -hmm. So as, as a, uh, a special ed teacher advising them, what would you have them look for because a lot of times uh, kids aren't identified until right. know, first or That's second true. or third grade. Mm -hmm. So how, how could uh, they be more facilitated in identifying these mm -hmm. students? Well, and, and it is frustrating having, um, you know, I don't know if your students know that my initial certification was pre-K-3. So I've done the little, the little guys too and taught third grade. Um, and it's true, when they're littler, oftentimes you'll find IEPs, I mean, even when they are identified, the IEPs will say speech only, which means they get very little services, and as a teacher, you get very few supports from a special ed teacher. So that does make it harder. Um, but I think it's fairly easy, I think, to start to see early our kids who have true attention issues or kids who are just adjusting to kindergarten or, you know, I mean, most kids kind of grow out of that fairly quickly. But if you're seeing a child who really just can't attend, then I think it's beneficial to start looking at things um, even as simple as seating. Where is the kid seated? Where is he close enough to you that, you know, you can give him those reminders? Um, you know, a space in the room, is he sitting by good role models? Um, is, is it possible to buddy him up with a third grader if he's a kindergarten? 
kid um, to have him be able to be removed from the room for a little while to get away from the stimuli. Um, I always really, just because of my background, I always really caution um, our little people teachers really want to um, like cover every inch of the wall with posters and artwork and hang things from the ceilings and you know what we know about our kids with attention issues or especially especially our kids who are on the spectrum on the autism spectrum somewhere um, that's really overwhelming to them so you know if, if you sense that I think you can even set up your I mean before you even start you can set up your room to be friendly toward students who um, might struggle attention wise or sensory wise